It's like, how do I stop this cycle? How do I stop doing this? And I can't keep sitting here and saying, well, I'm bipolar because like, yes. Okay. But like, that's not like a thing that you, you say is this is why I do this and how I act. And that's like me saying, I'm going to go kill that person. Well, I did it because I'm bipolar. That's yeah. it's, it's okay. I'm fine. No. So I, I, what I did is I really, I started leaning in a lot to personal development. You know, at 15 years old, I had a sexual assault and I didn't talk about it for a while. I've, I have heard many stories in my clinical work where people have had the same experience sharing with their, their protectors, their close, safe adults, where they disclose a trauma, they disclose something that happens to them and they are met with disbelief. They are met with outward rejection of the story. Um, the abuser is chosen over the child. The people who should be aren't there to protect the person. At least the person who's sharing doesn't feel that way. And I'm very sorry that that happened to you. Very sorry that it continues to happen. I'm really excited for today's guest, uh, Paris Prinkevich, who is the creator of the Crooked Illness podcast. And this podcast is pretty interesting because it, it takes her lived experience of mental health and being able to apply it to overall wellness and improve our life through talking about mental health and reducing stigma and getting more people educated on how to be there for people with mental health struggles. So let's get to it. So the thing that uh, stood out to me the most was just right from the start was the name of your podcast, The Crooked Illness. So I am curious as to the origin of that or what inspires that name. Yes, I would love to share that with you guys. So I actually did an episode talking about the origin because I ended up getting a lot of questions, right? Like same same with you. Why, why did you call it crooked illness? Where did that come from? Where did that originate from? So it actually comes from and stems from my own my own story and my own experiences. And it comes from two different perspectives that are different yet pretty similar at the same time. So the first perspective comes from when I was 19 years old. So at 19, I was diagnosed with bipolar one disorder, hospitalized, struggling really, really badly from inside that hospital during that time in my life. And then at 23 years old, um, I came out of college, graduated and ended up accepting my first job at the very same clinic where I actually received services at myself. So I kind of got to see things from, I call it the uh, patient perspective when um, myself, and then also the employee perspective. And what I really noticed in these two uh, perspectives was the stigma that was present, the stigma that was present in myself when I was struggling that really prevented me and held me back for a number of years from really getting help, really being able to move forward and just really being able to have a good and happy life. And then I also noticed that same similar kind of stigma when I was working with um, clients of my own, different kinds of patients. And I really decided you know, this is something that needs to be talked about more, that needs more attention and, and more awareness on this topic. And I call it crooked illness because at the time when I was struggling, I did not have the awareness to, to see the ways in which I was being crooked to my own self, but also to others around me and just my experience at the time in general, I did not have that awareness. And then once I was able to look back, reflect on that and really, really dig deeper into what it was like to be in those moments, I decided to launch my podcast in January of 2020 to tell this story and then end up creating a platform for other people to come on and tell me their stories related to mental health and mindset is the entire focus. So anything under that umbrella, whether it's a story, a resource, an experience, all of it. I love getting into it, love covering it because I always feel like every single day I'm continuing just to learn more and more things. And everyone has a story and something of value that they can contribute in some way that could potentially be very helpful to someone else. So that is it in a kind of longer nutshell of uh, what where crooked illness comes from. So you mentioned uh, at 19, that uh, seemed like a really pivotal uh, point in your life, both from your mental health perspective, but maybe even in your life trajectory. 
but it, I'm curious if it didn't start there, like in terms of your struggles or it, it just maybe not start there. So I actually, I actually just finished writing my first book, which is Crooked Illness, which actually I've been working on way before the podcast. I finally got it done, which really dives into all the details behind this, but my story did not start there. So at 16, I was actually diagnosed with, uh, misdiagnosed with depression and, you know, I, I have a family history of bipolar disorder, but whenever I would really bring it up, it would always be something that was um, just considered to not be a possibility because I had this facade that I was trying to uh, continue to maintain because I didn't really want people to, you know, worry about what was going on or all of these different things. But and it also contributed to me really not wanting to talk about a lot of my experiences because all the conversations that I heard um, growing up around mental health, around mental illness, around bipolar disorder were all very negative and had a very, you know, dark kind of focus. And it kind of really made me feel like I wasn't, I wasn't really able to get help for what I was dealing with. Cause I had that, you know, the stigma piece tied to all of the experiences. So it kind of started at, yeah, 16 years old, um, misdiagnosed with depression and then kind of, um, at 19 being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And you're saying misdiagnosed because you weren't giving the whole picture because you were kind of holding back on what was really going on with you. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. So many people do that. They come in and they're, they're afraid of what the truth may be. And so they, they mask certain parts of what's going on with them because they're functioning well enough, maybe that they can hide certain parts of it and they let other parts through because that's maybe more acceptable to be dysfunctional in. It's just so, and like the way that you talk about, I was crooked to myself. That's a really interesting way to look at it. I think that that's kind of like a beautiful, I'm, I'm envisioning this like, like a, like a, a desolate, isolated kind of crooked tree no limbs no like no no leaves no flowers kind mm -hmm. of like not giving itself the opportunity to flourish really what it was um because I remember you know I remember bring this bringing this up actually because my mom would sh shared with me and my siblings that her sister is bipolar and I just remember being really young and you know not really being able to understand what that meant or what that looked like because I remember you know every time we were around her she always seemed very excited, very happy, loved to do arts and crafts, all these things. And then hearing, you know, my mom's side of it and just hearing, you know, how, how difficult it was to, re to really help her and be around her and all these different things she experienced and gone through. I just had a very hard time understanding that because of the, because of what I was seeing and just being so young and, you know, he, all these things I heard about mental health were very stigmatized and um, negative. So it just made it really hard for me to really understand you know, what was going on with me and how can I use this experience and take these things that have happened and pull lessons from them. Mm -hmm. And instead of letting them, you know, keep me down, how can I do something about this to come out and be able to move forward and be able to encourage others and let them know that, you know, I was in that same place where I, you know, I remember going to, to therapy and counseling and, you know, different medications and still holding things back and not fully wanting to talk about, you know, different things that I experienced. And of course, a big piece of that to me was unresolved trauma. Mm -hmm. So not, uh, not going there, not, not knowing how to go there and not feeling like, feeling like I could ever recover from that. I feel like was a big contributor to, to that uh, along with also kind of, you know, when I was bringing up, um, bipolar disorder, you know, to, you know, my psychiatrist and th different things like that. And just, you know, having everyone around me essentially being like, no, you know, like, no, they're like you like, no, like you don't, you don't seem to have the symptoms, all these things. And I remember being like, I remember being like, well, you know, I just have all this just endless amounts of energy. You know, I'm working two jobs. I'm going out, spending all my money. I'm being very reckless and all these kinds of things. I'm like, what, like, what is this? What, it, what is going on? And it was almost like everyone was saying, well, you know, you look, good on the outside, right? You know, like you're working, you have relationships, you have, you know, friends you see, you have a, you know, a boyfriend, you, you're good with your family. So, you know, it, it almost, it, it just became really difficult to try to communicate what was going on. Cause I kind of felt like it was almost like no one 
really wow. saw that. It's so, I see that all the time in substance use disorder treatment. Like as long as you have it just a little bit together, as long as the train hasn't completely gone off the rails, like they, there may not be a conductor in the engine anymore, but as long as the train's still on the rails, people are like, you no, you're fine. You don't need to go get treatment. But like, there is so much unnecessary suffering that happens because other people and ourselves are unwilling, unable whatever to really listen to the story of another person without our own bias. Yes. Oh my gosh. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with more with that. And that's really what I, you know, I would feel and I would see going on with when I was stuck in that struggle. And I, a lot of that, honestly, that contributed to that was looking back was the mindset that I had during that time and the, the thoughts that I was having, the habits that I was doing on a continuous daily basis and really having to like take a step back and look at my life and say, clearly something is not going right here. I'm not happy. I'm not excited. I'm not fulfilled. I wake up every single day and I just constantly focus on, you know, the stresses, the things that are pulling me down, the things that have happened that have been hard and just honestly painting this picture for myself that everything else moving forward is going to be bad and mm -hmm. there is not going to be anything good. So how do I, sh what do I do to get out of that? How do I shift this? And, you know, that's really what I love talking about too, is just the work that I've been able to do on myself and that I really, really had to do in order to kind of come out of this place and really take myself from this position of very, almost being very hopeless in, in my thought processing of, can I move forward or will I ever be able to you know, be able to be happy and just have a good life and all these things. So I think that's a big part of it too, is just, you know, the mindset work and also kind of having an awareness of what went on in the past and, you know, where I am now and, you know, where I'd like to go and just all of it is really important. I think. Hearing your mom talk about her experience with the family member that had mm -hmm. bipolar that I mm -hmm. wonder if there's that tie in of like, oh, I can't share that to my mom. Cause look what happened, mm -hmm. you know, with her and her family member. I don't want to do that to people. And, mm -hmm. and, and so I can't, I can't unload, um, that burden onto people. And so then did, did that lack of engagement in that way lead to even though it's still happening, like it's still impacting family, like, Hey, I'm doing this to try to protect. I don't want to burden people but oftentimes, at least in my experience, we see it getting there anyways. Yeah. It just ends up getting in there in a way we don't probably prefer it to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think in the beginning, you know, um, when I was 19 and I, I was hospitalized and I actually ended up, you know, es essentially putting myself there because I'm like, this is like, I'm just like, I'm, I feel like I'm going crazy right now. I'm like, no one around me is noticing what's happening. So I'm like, I need to, I need to get treatment. I need to do something about this. But I remember, you know, in the beginning of that, when I got the diagnosis, um, it made, I thought it was going to make things easier because I was like, okay, you know, you know, I was in the hospital, I got the diagnosis. Now I know, you know, a little bit about what's going on. I can try to, you know, um, get treatment for this and continue moving forward. But it almost, it made it harder for, our relationship because of, and I think it's because of the experiences that my mom had with, with her sister with, with uh, the bipolar. And, you know, she was talking about, you know, her, just her situation and her experience of, you know, not wanting to, uh, go to therapy or do, um, medications, nothing, and just kind of wanting to, uh, um, you know, try to work through things on her own, but was having a very, very hard time with that. And it kind of really ended up fracturing the relationship. And I feel like because of that, um, it really, you know, made it very hard for me because, you know, being so young and just kind of like, you know, trying to figure out how, how to move forward from this. Like, where do I go from here? Like, I know I can't control that I received this diagnosis, but I can control how I respond moving forward. And, you know, she just in, wasn't uh, supportive in the beginning. I remember, um, you know, and I think part of this also stems back to the unresolved trauma piece that I was talking about. Cause you know, at 15 years old, I had a sexual assault and I didn't talk about it for a while. And I remember finally, you know, the day that I brought it up and I was, you know, expecting her to, you know, react, you know, somewhat, um, 
you know, comforting or, you know, like something like that, but it wasn't, yeah, it was very, um, not good. Um, you know, she essentially like, you know, like that was your fault and, you know, this is, you know, it was just, it wasn't really a good experience. And I think because of that, like she just, I don't know what, and I partially, what I think is just the fact of, you know, her having, unresolved trauma within her family and then kind of that carrying over. So it wasn't, it was just in the beginning, it really, really wasn't good. And it kind of caused a lot of issues in the relationship. And, you know, it was just, it was hard. It was really, really hard. And I had to keep, you know, just kind of reminding myself, like you can, you can do things to kind of pull yourself out of this and move forward. And it, it was kind of hard because, you know, especially being, you know, in that experience, you would think, you know, you're, mom would be supportive and whatever, but she wasn't. But I mean, and I kind of, you know, now we're good. You know, I kind of like learned that she she was doing, I guess the best she could at the time. It wasn't, it wasn't. And and I don't like to look at that as, you know, she was intentionally trying to hurt me Mm -hmm. by the things she was saying. And it came, and I don't know where exactly, you know, saying the things she said came from, but I, I just, I don't like to focus too much on the negative. You know, I like to look at the the bigger picture and say, you know what, let's try to, you know, take something from this that can be helpful moving forward and kind of, cause I feel like it gets pretty easy, you know, once you get started of focusing on, you know, things that were hurtful or things that were bad and kind of to get, to get started on this whole kind of train downward spiral of now this is bad, or this isn't going to work because this happened. So I like to kind of, you know, stay away from that and kind of to look, look forward to, different things that, you know, were helpful and were good because there's always, I think a lot more of that than sometimes we even realize. Yeah. And before we, before we move on from that piece, just want to, I, I have heard many stories in my clinical work where people have had the same experience sharing with their, their protectors, their close, safe adults, where they disclose a trauma They disclose something that happens to them and they are met with disbelief. They are met with outward rejection of the story. Um, The abuser is chosen over the child. The people who should be aren't there to protect the person. At least the person who's sharing doesn't feel that way. And I'm very sorry that that happened to you. Very sorry that it continues to happen. But I think it's important just to recognize before we move on for anybody who's listening or watching that most of the time when that almost every time when that happens, it has everything to do with the person who's hearing the news and absolutely nothing to do with you. Yes. yes. Like there, there is something about that news that is overwhelming to them that they can't handle. And so they, they go to these automatic responses that are not particularly helpful for the person sharing, but it may be their only way to cope. Like you said, she was doing the best she could with what she had at the time. And none of that excuses anything, of course, none of that, but it also doesn't change the way that you felt, which was invalidated and confused and, you know, well, and I think it was, I mean, it sounds, I mean, it sounds very much like what we would call a tap in. So mm-hmm. it taps into our own personal experience. And, and so she wasn't coming to that conversation, just hearing your story. She was hearing your story combined with her sister's story. So it, there was a lot of emotional baggage tied to that place that she was in. And I don't think it probably triggered much conscious thought but more reactive Mm -hmm. reflexive you know going back to states that she was in where she couldn't maybe help her sister in the way that she wanted or whatever that Mm -hmm. might i think it's kind of also like tied back to herself because you know honestly um it's just like the relationship she had with her father and just not um not a good one at all and i even remember you know the day that he passed away. I found it on Facebook and I went to uh, call her and let her know. And she, I remember I was in class in college and she was like, well, like, why did you leave your class to tell me this? Like, I don't really care. Go back. And it was just, um, and it kind of reminded me of there's a pattern here, you know, like if, what if I didn't resolve my trauma, would I potentially later in my life treat my kid, my somebody like this because of what my experience has been like. So it kind of makes me, have a better understanding of something could have potentially happened to her. And because I remember I would bring it up a lot, like maybe we should all go to like family therapy or do counseling um, because, and it was always shut down. And I just remember, you know, being like, well, I went to therapy when I was younger and it could potentially help, but I, but there's still like a big stigma still, I think um, 
within uh, my family a little bit, but I think it's getting a lot better because of what I'm doing and, you know, the podcast and, you know, coming out with my book and I'll just trying to do whatever I can to kind of bring more attention and awareness to this. I think it's getting better. Um, and I think that's incredible because, you know, I think we all at some point have struggled in some capacity with our mental health, whether it be like having a diagnosis, being hospitalized or not, just in, just in, in, in experiencing, you know, really heightened emotions of sadness and anxiety and having periods of depression. We've, we've all had some, uh, some kind of an event or something that has, that has taken place in our life that has left us feeling a certain way. So I think that when we're able to open up the doors for people to talk about this and have these conversations and do these things without feeling judged or feeling criticized or feeling, um, embarrassed or shamed by these things, I think it will continue to make a lot of things uh, a lot better. One of the things I would love to see happen is to see judgment removed from diagnosis, like yeah. diagnosis. So a diagnosis of a mental illness, the stigma associated with that is so crazy to me compared to diagnosis of physical illness. Somebody gets diagnosed with, you know, diabetes, cancer, hypothyroidism, whatever. It's just, okay, there's, there's something not going correctly in your body. And there is a, there is a treatment to handle that. And there's, we don't, we don't talk about physical illness with the same consistent negative outlook that we do mental illness. So, you know, clearly a theme in the family was mental illness is negative. There's nothing positive. Everything is bad. Mental illness equals bad. And I think that's a stigma that still exists. And what we've been talking about on a few episodes is there's a difference between mental illness and mental health. And talking about mental health, I think would hopefully, I mean, it's kind of what we're doing, is that by talking about mental health, we can draw some attention to like, there are positive sides of mental health. When, we, when you talk about mental health, we're not talking necessarily all the time about mental illness. We're not talking about symptoms necessarily, and we're not talking about dysfunction. We're talking about health the same way that we talk about physical health. Yes. I love that. I love that so much. That actually reminds me of um, a conversation I have. So I volunteer at NAMI as well, mm -hmm. um, an incredible organization. I'm one of the women in one of the, the meetings was talking about this, the same thing you just brought up about physical health and mental health and was saying, you know, when you have, uh, you know, someone who has been hospitalized for, you know, schizophrenia or bipolar or whatever, it, whatever it is, they're hospitalized. They don't, they don't receive you know, the same attention as someone who's been hospitalized for, you know, a physical uh, mm -hmm. disease or maybe an injury car accident or something physically has happened to you and you were in the hospital, you know, she was talking about, you know, a lot of those people might receive flowers or, you know, visitors or cards. But then on the other side, when we're looking at, you know, someone who's struggling with in some kind of way with mental health, it's not received the same way or looked at the same way. It's kind oh, of seen it. Yeah. When you get out of the mental hospital, People stay away from you because, oh, you need space. You've just been through something. But nobody's like afraid to come over because they're going to overwhelm you because you just had like a quadruple bypass. Like they're, they're surrounding you to let you know that you're cared about. That is a huge difference well, between the two aspects. I think fear taps into it. So I, okay. I, would, I would equate that I don't want to go down that road because I'm scared to death of that road and where it's leading. Mm -hmm. And then I would also say that we as a society – are ill-equipped to under to help those mental health issues. Like we don't know what even to do. I don't even know. You're bipolar one. I don't. What am I supposed to do? I, mm -hmm. I haven't you know experienced that. So I would rather just shut it down, mm -hmm. and say no. You know, uh, no, we're not going to talk about that. You know, you're you're you know putting, you're being fake or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and in that way, I'm protecting myself. There, it's so abstract. Mental health is almost abstract it is. If, if it's a broken leg i i get it you put the yeah. bone back together you brace it up and mm -hmm. you're good to go but w depression like what am i supposed to do with that yeah um and and so the other thing i would kind of add to that is over complex like just what is needed mm -hmm. like i'm not asking you to solve my depression i just want you to kind of be there mm -hmm. for me and i love that oh my gosh i love that so much because that actually reminds me of you know, when I was younger and I brought up not knowing 
because I remember being 13 years old and going to a sleepover and hearing my friend talk about her uncle who was bipolar. And that was the first time in my life I've ever heard the word bipolar, bipolar disorder. And I remember, you know, her saying, well, you know, if you're bipolar, that means you have, you know, these crazy mood swings. And, you know, she, she was like one, one second, he'd be really happy. And then he'd have a knife out threatening to hurt my aunt. And I, and I remember hearing that and being like, I'm like, how do you resp-? I'm like, what would you do? I'm like, and I'm like, I don't even know what I would, how I would be or act or what I would say or think in that situation. Cause I don't, I'm like, I've never been exposed to that. I've never been around that. And, and, and I think that's a, a lot of the same for, you know, a lot of people who don't, you know, maybe they haven't, maybe they, they don't know they've been around people, you know, who they, who are really, who are, they're really close to, who've been diagnosed with a mental illness and they, they don't know that, but they don't know what, what to do. You know, if someone starts crying in front of them, or if someone, you know, has a panic attack, or if somebody, you know, is, is actually suicidal and tell, and, and actually like in that, in that space, pe- a lot of people don't know what to say because they, they think, okay, what if I do something or say something and it makes it worse? Or, you know, I don't know what to do and just feeling very helpless and mm-hmm. very stuck. And I think that's why like s- these conversations are so important to like, you know, let people in on, you know, what, what is this like, you know, from someone who has experienced, you know, has been diagnosed with bipolar mm-hmm. disorder, I can tell you my experience and it doesn't always look the same as everybody else's, but you know, it's, it's one insight into this thing that might give somebody a better understanding because I know people have told me, you know, like I've listened to your podcast and my dad is diagnosed bipolar or my brother is diagnosed bipolar or my friend or this person. And, you know, hearing you talk about these topics is helping me understand this Mm -hmm. better or like understand how to, you know, have a better relationship with this person. And I think that's really important to me is just like the impact and trying to, you know, spread this message and just help people and educate people and let people know that, you know, this is, you know, not something to be afraid of or to be ashamed of. Like, because like you were saying, you know, mental health, you know, we talk about physical health and, you know, diet and exercise, there's like, no stigma. No, it's just like completely normal. It's like talking about the weather and my hope and my dream for the future is to one day have to be in a place where, you know, we're having conversations about mental health as easy as we are talking about the weather. I would love to see a transition when people are talking about mental health or mental illness. Doesn't really matter how you phrase it, but we spend a lot of time talking about the spiral and not a whole lot of time focusing on the solution. People will spend a lot of time talking about, you know, what their manic episodes looked like, what their depressive episodes looked like. And then there's this little, and then I went to therapy and now I'm better. Yes. It's like, okay, I, I very much appreciate that you did work on yourself and I honor the way that you want to speak about your journey and your recovery. But at the same time, like we, we aren't transitioning that lens from talking about diagnoses as something mental health diagnoses that are kind of like the end of the road, like, okay, this is who you are. This is your base state. This is your plateau. There, there is a way to create change in your brain. There is a way to create change for yourself. If you don't want to just ride the waves the way that your aunt did, that's, if you want to ride the waves, have a great time, but there is something else to do. I think that's so incredible that you just brought that up, like making this more, um, solution based rather than problem focused, because I feel like a lot of these conversations tend to be, you know, you know, okay. Like, you know, this is what it was like, you know, when I was struggling in the hospital and then like all these different, and I can go on and on and on about this, but like, what about the solution? It's like, it's almost like a very shorter segment. Like, okay, you know, I went to therapy and now medications and all this little stuff I did and I'm good. And, but it's like, shouldn't there be, you know, like a little bit more into that conversation, a little bit more details on that. And, um, to kind of talk about more about that, to kind of shift in that, I think that'll actually essentially end up shifting the view of mental health and mental illness related conversations from being more negative to more positive, because we're now focusing more on what do we do about this or how, like, what can we do moving forward? Or like, what are the solutions or what, what are the resources? What's here for support instead of saying, you know, and a kind of looking at people in a way of, well, you know, you've received this diagnosis, you're SMI, um, and you know, you're not really going to be able to really contribute anything. And that's kind of a lot of the feelings that I would get, you know, um, when I was in treatment and kind of, even when I was in the hospital, like I remember talking to everyone on my floor and just kind of just really paying attention to a lot of what was going on and kind of really noticing that, 
I think one of the biggest pieces that was missing was just encouraging people, Mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, what are your goals when, when you leave here? Like, what, what do you want to do? What are you interested in? What are you excited about? And like, and also I think it's, it's incredibly important to focus on the treatment aspect as well. I'm not saying like, just do this. We need, we need to also kind of encourage people and like, and look at them in a way of you can come out of this rather than, okay, you know, did you take your medication today? Good. Did you sleep eight hours? Okay, good. Did you go to group? Good. Um, okay. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Yes. I check. And I remember I brought that up too, to my, I remember when I was in the hospital, I said, I was like, um, to my doctor who was, she would go around and, you know, do the checks with everyone. I was like, well, I remember being like, well, aren't you going to, you know, ask me like what I'm going to do when I go home or like anything like my goals or like any, and then I just remember her being like, no. And I remember, I just remember being like, okay. (laughs) And I I was very shocked by that. There's issues in terms of, I think it relates to stigma where, where mental health, um, I think and more of an opposite of what you're describing about that doctor is checking off the boxes, you know, they can go to therapy and they can get someone who's really listening to them and really supporting them and helping them through that. And, but none of that's really happening outside. So like, you know, your friends are not there for you in certain capacities, your mm-hmm. family, they're not filling any of these voids. So there's really not any good motivation for them to stop therapy. And, and so I think people can get stuck mm-hmm. or helpless or hopeless because they're trying to change everything in this one basket and not thinking about all these other baskets that they have out there. And so, Uh, you know, that that's where stigma, I think really hurts the most is that people can't find what they need in their life. Mm -hmm. They can only find it in, you know, the therapist office or, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the intensive outpatient group or, or whatever. So the idea it's, it's almost like similar concept to, you know, someone leaves prison where they're, they got three meals and a cot and everything yep. and, and then they leave and then they have nothing. And so then they break laws to get back into prison because that's where they feel safest. And we see that in hospitalizations. When I worked at the hospital, mm-hmm. you just kept seeing a, same, a same folks because it was like, man, they're mm-hmm. getting, they're getting therapy groups uh, several times a day. They're getting nurses tending to their needs mm-hmm. frequently. They're getting, you know, fairly okay food and you know and but they're getting food and then they're leaving and then they're going back to these issues that are not resolving it you're perpetuating the cycle and it's like so hard to break that cycle if you don't try to impact the community i love that you brought that up because that was honestly for me the biggest piece that i really had to start looking at was you know even when, even when I came home from the hospital at 19 and even when I was, even when I was working in the clinic at 23 and I'm 25 now, I still was not, I was, I was doing good, but mentally, like I was still, you know, surrounding myself with people who were not good for me, putting myself in environments that were not good for me. And I, and I wasn't really, I still kind of, I knew I'm like, I shouldn't be around these people. You know, they don't really care you know about me or whatever it is, but I still would keep doing that. And I'm like, and I went, then I would step back and say, you know, I, I'm not happy. I don't feel good doing these things. You know, what can I do to change this? What habits in my life do I do on a daily basis? What do I need to take out? And what do I need to start putting in? What do I need to start giving more time to in order to start actually feeling good? And that way I will actually be more impactful on people instead of feeling so stuck and feeling like, well, this is just the way my life is. You know, these are the people I'm around. This is my environment. I can't change it because that was how I was for a very long time was. And I started to feel that way. I think because I was so focused on the struggle, so focused on the problem. I couldn't even see the possibility of a solution because I, I almost basically essentially kind of like brainwash myself into thinking there is none, there is no solution. This is your life. You need to stay this way. And once I started to look at these things and say, okay, you know, I should start eating better. I should start going back to exercising. Like I used to, I should stop, you know, going out every weekend and drinking and and partying with, with people who only enjoy me for being entertaining and wild and out, you know, outlandish and not really me, you know, I need to start doing these things instead of just thinking about them and saying, well, maybe one day, you know, uh, you know, because that doesn't happen. You know, you don't just wake up one day and it's poof, like there it is, you know, you're good, you're great. 
you know, everything that you wanted is, is here. We need to start taking steps and putting systems in place to make this a reality instead of just hoping for it to be one one day. So I'm, I'm curious because the question that's standing out to me is you, I, you've identified in terms of your own podcast and you brought it up today about, okay, I was diagnosed at 19 bipolar and that seemed, um, and that, that hasn't always been my experience from my perspective that seeing the diagnosis of bipolar one as being something that gives you some direction or maybe hope or where a lot of times for many people, it can be the opposite. I've got this disorder. Oh, have you heard about bipolar and how, you know, untreatable it is and, you know, all these different things. I'm curious as to how your mindset found it to be something you can do something about Mm -hmm. and find your health versus maybe just leaning into it and being like, well, this is me. Yeah. Cause that that's, I love that you bring that up. Cause that was definitely how I used to be. I remember when I first came home um, from the hospital and I was in community college at the time. I remember I had a class and it was an incredible class I went to. And I just, I would always use, you know, bipolar as an, I started to use it as almost as an excuse. Well, I'm like this because I'm bipolar. I was, I'm like, do about it. I got got bipolar. And I'm, and I, and I, it it was almost like, I didn't even notice anymore because it was just like what I would do all the time. And then I started to realize, you know, like looking, look, taking a step back and saying, you know, I am not happy right now. And I'm, and I, I would sit there and say, you know, I turned into this person who I said I never would become, who's actually hurting other people around me. I'm hurting my friends and I'm not trying to just like, and it's like, how do I stop this cycle? How do I stop doing this? And I can't keep sitting here and saying, well, I'm bipolar because like, yes. Okay. But like, that's not like a thing that you, you say is this is why I do this and how I act. And that's like me saying, I'm going to go kill that person. Well, I did it because I'm bipolar. That's it's, yeah. it's okay. I'm fine. No. So I, I, what I did is I really, I started leaning in a lot to personal development and working on myself and reading like hun- hundreds of books, you know, and actually sitting here and saying, is there something of value in my experience or in my story be- that I could put out there? Because for years I was terrified of anyone ever finding out that I was hospitalized, that I was diagnosed bipolar, that I struggled in any way because I was so used to having this facade of I'm fine or I'm okay. And I think that came from, I think, wanting to protect myself from the the effects of the sexual assault. And just like, and that was my thing to, you know, I'm okay. It's great. You know, I, I'm, I look good on the outside. I seem like I'm doing good. You know, there's nothing to, nothing to be worried about. I really had to say, you know what? I have had this experience. I have had these, whatever it may be, obstacles, challenges, struggles, whatever it may be. And I could take these lessons and put this into something that I can put out there and turn into something that can help people. Because I sat there and I'm like, what would this have been like for me if I was younger and I heard someone else talking about this in a way, a different kind of way? Because I never found that anywhere. I never found anywhere, you know, anyone talking about, um, bipolar disorder, you know, any kind of topic on mental health in a positive light. And I'm, I'm just like, it has to, that that's what has to change is we have to make this more of a positive conversation instead of, because if it's not, then who's, who is ever going to feel comfortable coming forward and, and, and saying, you know, I'm dealing with this. What do I do about it? Or like getting help because we're just, we're just holding, we're just continuing to hold each other down and saying, well, no, you're supposed to be fine. You're supposed to be okay. Just, you know, forget about it. Just, you know, try to push to the back of your mind, move forward. I really had to, to start looking at myself and, and I, that helped me gain awareness and say, wow, like I really am not feeling like a good person anymore. I really am not happy. I really do not enjoy my life. And then I sat there and I said, you know what? I have so many blessings. I have so many things in my life, so many people who care. I have so many things that I've accomplished. Why don't I put more attention onto those things instead of these things that were hard and challenging and difficult? Why don't I wake up every day and say, these are three things I'm grateful for. And I put together this, um, it's a free 28 day gratitude journal for people to start and end their days on the best foot possible by starting your days like this, ending your days like this. And I used to be one of those people who would sit there and say, what is right? What is a, what is sitting here saying, 
what I'm grateful for we're going to do for me. And that was because it was very difficult and really, really hard for me to even identify three things I was grateful for because Mm -hmm. I was so focused on the negative. Yes. Yes. And that is what really has started to open up things for me is practicing gratitude, doing this journaling and just reading books and just trying to learn more and try every single day, continuing to do that and just not giving up and not saying, you know, okay, like, you know, I feel like I'm good. Like I've, I've done enough work. Like I'm, I don't need to do it anymore. Like I love it now. I love, you know, doing this, you know, coming on podcasts, connecting with people, hearing people's stories and trying to add value in any way that I can. I just, it's brought so much joy to my life that I, it's very hard for me now to even really focus on the negative. Cause I've, I've brought in so much of that. Sounds interesting. Cause I see it probably a lot with, uh, people in SUD mm. treatment where, um, they focus more on the process and that's more healing than worried about the product. So, uh, you know, like if, if we, like, I think about just what you're saying, if, as far as gratitude, like, I think one of the issues is if I'm really depressed, I'm looking for some really big thing to be grateful for or happy about when just having a good breakfast not even could that. be appreciative it's, enough or it's getting literally up or opening my eyes right, today. Right. And one of the, one of the things that you're talking about, kind of a shift that you made for yourself when you realize this is not the person I want to be. And this is not how I want to treat the people around me. What, what I tell people in treatment all the time, most people enter treatment, mental health or substance use, because they are, they want to avoid or remove something. So we're looking to avoid a consequence or remove a symptom or a certain type of dysfunction that typically gets the ball rolling. But in my experience where continued sustainable mental health lives is that journey, that kind of walk that you started it, the, the goal of the walk transitions from being about avoiding or removing. And I, I always tell them, I'm like, where, where are you at with the corner? I talk about it like turning a 90 degree corner because the 90 degree change is I'm no longer trying to avoid or remove something. I'm now chasing positive things that I found along the way. I'm no longer focused on avoiding something that I deem negative. I'm now chasing positive things that I see in myself, in my environment, the people around me, and my opportunities, whatever. It is a real paradigm shift within yourself. And I think, you know, 19 years old, checking yourself into a mental hospital, good for you. I wish more people had that type of bravery. Um, in those moments, it's, pro- it's impossible to think in those moments, I'm sure, that like there's never going to be a corner, yeah, no, the, I totally agree with you. Cause I, if, if I reflect back, you know, to, to remember being 19 and being, you know, in that hospital, it like, it, it was because it was very difficult for me to even focus on anything positive or anything, you know, somewhat exciting for my future because I was so stuck in this struggle. And I just, I, I was continuing to also make myself feel more sick by continuing to, you know, let a lot of things go on in my life that I knew I'm like, okay, well, I I should probably, you know, not be around these people or not, you know, not do these things or whatever. But, you know, I just was like, you know, I just, I, I essentially basically gave up on myself and it was almost like I didn't really care anymore. What, what were, what could possibly take place or what could possibly happen to me? Because, I just reached this point of this is how it is. And I, and I now even talking about this is, is just wild to me to even reflect back to thinking that I used to feel like that was my life forever. Is that that way? I point out and circle back to Doug's earlier point that especially when you're raised in a family, in a culture, in a society, you know, there's many layers to how we become the people that we are as young adults. How could you? think that there would be anything possible after receiving news like that when the only messaging you have ever heard about mental health and mental illness is nothing but Stay negative. Away, yeah. How how could there be, there? there is no neural pathway in your brain that connects a diagnosis with hope or positivity for the future. Oh yeah. And I remember even just being in the hospital and I remember when I was there, I was like, okay, this is actually good because I'm here, you know, I'll, and my thought this is what I would think. I thought, you know, people go into hospitals and they leave and then they get treatment. They're good. They're great. Everything's great. But I remember talking to every single patient on my floor and hearing people tell me, you know, I've been hospitalized 19 times. I've been hospitalized 10 times. And I'm sitting there 
just listening to the stories of these people, listening to these things they're telling me. And I'm like, and I'm sitting here thinking that, you know, it, it was just crazy to me to be like, I, I wanted to think, you know, what, what has to change for these the people, the people here are the, you know, whatever it is, is it the treatment? Like, I'm like, something has to, something has to be different because, you know, they, and like, like you mentioned earlier, you know, people keep coming in and out of, you know, prisons or in and out of hospitalizations and you keep seeing it all the time. And it's almost like a revolving door. And because, you know, they get, they get the, you know, the, and I, I know part of it too, is I was talking to some people there and they, they would share, you know, well, I'm, I'm homeless. I have nowhere to go. So I, and I remember this guy, the, one of the guys there who was this older guy and he was telling me, he was telling me, um, I thought that I remember seeing him for the first time and just being like, I've never seen anyone like this in my life who just runs around and like slams into walls and, and just cannot form sentences. And I'm like, does, I don't even know if he speaks English or if he can, I don't even, I don't know. And I'm just, I've never seen this before. And then actually having him sit across from me at a table when we were alone and completely speak to me normal and just, t- and I was like in shock. I'm like, and I'm sitting there thinking like, why would you do this? And and I'm sitting there thinking, well, because he has nowhere else to go, mm-hmm. he comes here and they, and it, it just makes me sad too about, you know, like there's a bed available for him. And then, yeah, you, cu- you come here and, you know, they have meals, they have the groups, they have, you know, the, the, tr- the treatment and stuff, some of the services they do, but then, then what, then what, once your time is up? Yeah. There's so little support when you leave those like high intensity situations, which we've talked about forever and is a big part of the reason why at this point in my life, I don't, I would never want to work in a residential setting. Like I want to be, I feel like I find my purpose in the outpatient world where we outpatient is where the wheels fall off the bus. Like I want to be there for you when the wheels fall off the bus and I want to be there to help you put it back together and get it going again. Like I, I talk about the struggle bus a lot with my clients and I'm like, listen, even if you're on the struggle bus, at least you're still moving, <laughs> you know? And then like, we talk about it like a spectrum. There's a, you're on the struggle bus. You may be at a struggle bus stop. Might need to get off the road. You're and on. then, and then you may be in a struggle bus trap. Like you may be in a struggle <laughs> trap. Like they're, they're not, neither, none of them are particularly bad or evil or scary, but like you can be going through a struggle and still have positives. You can be having a really bad day with your depression, but have a really good lunch. You could be in a manic phase, but have a really great conversation with somebody that you come across in the grocery store. You could be in the middle of a psychotic episode and appreciate a beautiful sunset. Like there is something to be appreciated and there is something positive in every day, no matter what struggle you're currently in. I mean, 2020 was a trip with COVID. Like there was many times where like Doug would look at me and say, how are you? And I couldn't answer the question because if I answered the question, the, the whole, the mask would break. And I was like, we don't have time for that right now. I said, someday, sir, someday, sir, I will answer your question. But that day is not today because quite frankly, I do not have the time to give you the answer. But even in those days, it was so important to take the time to go home and say, like, at least I'm not going through this alone. At least I have a team of people around me that I know that I can count on. And 2020 has been hard. COVID has been crazy. People are, it is, my little introvert heart has never been so excited that, like, social isolation is acceptable. It's, like, okay for me not to leave my apartment for a whole weekend. And that may be fine for somebody who's putting an effort towards their mental health But for people who didn't enter the pandemic with those types of resources, this has been a really scary time mental health wise. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. And I really agree with you there because, you know, I just think that's that's what you said right there is trying to find everything to appreciate in, in your days, even if it's one thing, there's there's always something there. But I feel like especially, you know, like when we are in these struggles and we're we're dealing with these things, it it becomes very hard because it kind of reminds me of the example of, you know, when you're driving and you, and, and you get into a car accident, you know, like you don't wake up and expect today's the day I'm going to get in a car accident at 1 30 PM. This is going to happen. I plan this. I'm ready for it. No, like it just, and then for me, you know, like I remember, you know, getting hit one time and just it being so overwhelmed by that. And so like worried about, you know, is what's going on that I couldn't even focus on 
you know, am I okay? Is this person okay? Like it, it just becomes your, cause you're, you're all your attention, all your focus, everything is going to this thing, this event, this, this thing that is, is hurting you is, has done something to you that is not good and is holding you back. But if we could at least try to say, okay, like there's something to come out of this and just, and try to do that. And I know it's, it's very hard. It's not, it's not easy. And I'm not here to say you guys, this is easy. Like if you're struggling, like it's no, it's not, but like, that's the thing. That's the beauty in it is there's always something about every single day. Like we're here, we're alive, we're awake you know, like, like, it's so easy to take so many things for granted. It's so, so easy to sit here and say, you know, like anything that we have, or we've done, or we've accomplished, you know, that, you you know, why we might be sitting here saying, well, that's not good enough, you know, like, yeah, okay, well, if you're sitting here saying, well, you know, one of my things I always wanted to do was to go to college and graduate, I did it, but that's not good enough. And I think we always have these, like, points that we, we set up for ourselves of once we get to this point, Mm -hmm. then I'll be happy. Once I get that, then I'll, and then once you get it, well, now I need, now we need this, or we need to change this and this and that. And it's almost like we are setting ourselves up for this unattainable search for happiness or fulfillment, because we're always telling like, no, you can't be like that. Now you can't be happy. Now you need to wait. Um, and then once you get that, well, no, you still need to do this, or you still need to work on this. And it's almost like, then are you ever going to be happy? Right. And personally, one of the things that I've learned over my short 32 years is that almost everything that I like the most about myself has come out of sometimes extreme struggle or hardship. The, the characteristics that I like most about myself, the, the things that I like most about myself, the things that I am the most proud of are products of something that was very uncomfortable, very stressful, very taxing. Those are the things that I like the best about myself. Oh, yeah. And I think that's really, that's such an important thing to do, to focus on as well, because I feel like we always try to focus on, you know, these, you know, maybe it's like external things or whatever it is, but the things that we, that, that have made us who are, who we are through these struggles or different, you know, challenging times, difficult situations, trauma, loss, whatever it is that have turned us into who we are today. And like, that's incredible. And to like actually celebrate that rather than being like, you know, hating these, like the way that this, this has actually shaped us. And I think is really important to kind of call attention to that too, because, you know, it's, I think it's always easier to focus on, the negative or the most overwhelming moments when, when we, when we give attention to one thing, but then it's like, once you start to say, okay, well, I woke up today. Mm-hmm. Um, I can see, I can walk. Um, I have, you know, my friends or, you know, I'm having a conversation with this person later. I'm excited about just, th- and then it starts to become easier. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what I found is like, once you start small, like start, get up and say, what is one thing you're grateful for today? And then try like doing two next week or just, it gets, starts, it starts to get so much easier to, to notice these things mm-hmm. that we're excited about, that we're blessed to have, that we become, whatever it is that you are happy about that makes you happy, that g- gives you a sense of gratitude or gratefulness. It becomes easier to, to identify those things. And then once we start to do that, I feel like, at least in my experience, it becomes harder to go back to focusing on the negative, yeah. which is pretty wild. I think that you have to take a really conscious effort to do that. So, mm-hmm. you know, we talked about, we have a segment um, that everybody should go watch um, on, <laughs> LOL. An, uh, LOL, right? <laughs> on the negativity bias. And, uh-huh. and so our brain is naturally going to gravitate towards the negative. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I kind of see tapping into that uh, struggle bus is that bus is on autopilot. Mm-hmm. So we're not really, we're running through life on autopilot and mm-hmm. not taking any conscious engagement in life. And so yeah. you have to, to do what you're talking about really requires you to consciously step in and say, okay, I got to get off autopilot mm-hmm. and I got to do this and I'm going to schedule it and do it, make sure it's part of my day mm-hmm. and, you know, be able to do that. Or we continue just doing the same th- these same templates that are just Mm -hmm. built in our brain from all of our experiences, we Mm -hmm. just keep going down and doing those things. So I think, you know, getting people to kind of say, okay, I got to take a conscious, I need to make a conscious effort. And so I'm curious as to, was there an experience you had that really 
tapped into that or really turned things like the epiphany to, moment of like, like oh man I or that pivotal fiddle, you know like that uh tipping point i think is what gladwell's book of that tipping point where it just turned you into that direction of actually i remember this so i remember two of my friends who are incredible they invited me to there was an event um here uh at here in scottsdale and they said hey like and i know ne- i was never like they were telling me like there's an event here, you know, there's all these speakers coming and telling their stories and personal development and like, you know, networking. And I was always like, I was like, no, like in my head, I'm like, I'm, I don't want to go to that. I don't want to do that. It's too early. It's all day. Like, I, no, 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 no. And they're like, well, like, come, just come. Like, we'll have you a seat for you. And I was, and I remember going and I'm like, well, I, I can only stay for like, I have to leave. Like, and I'm like, and I'm like lying. Like I have an appointment later when it's like, I don't, I just, I don't want to, I just have to like, I don't want to be there. So I went and I remember hearing these people get up on stages and just like hearing them talk about their stories and their experiences. And I'm like, wow. And I like, I remember sitting there just thinking like, people can do this. I'm like, like, I'm like, I know about this. I'm like, I, of course, you know, like there's people get on stages and do speaking engagements and do all these things, but I'm like, I've never, I've never been here and like seen this and, you know, been in the audience and actually been here in person. I remember like seeing this and actually, um, talking to the guy who organized the event, you know, got his book. And I was like, this is what I need to start doing more because I left. I remember, I, I remember leaving and I never felt this way. I am just feeling like so fired up so excited about actually just being alive just being alive like I never felt like so excited just to be here and I'm like wow like I can actually do something and I, I'm like I can do something and and add value in some way I don't know what it is and I'm like I don't know what I'm gonna do or how I'm gonna do it or what it's gonna look like but I can I can do it and that was the first time ever that I thought that I can do that instead of being like no like no, like you can't, no, you just need to focus on trying not to have another breakdown. That's what, that's what you're doing. That's what you're focusing on. And I remember leaving this. And that was when I I started to think, you know, maybe I could tell my story without being so afraid. And I still, the time was very afraid. And it took, I think another year or probably six months after that until I actually did it. But that event is what got me back in because I used to read a lot and then I just stopped reading I never read anymore Uh um never would like do any of these things that I used to enjoy so much I didn't I just stopped doing it so I started I'm like I need to start reading more books because I read his book and I loved it I'm like I need to start finding you know personal development mindset work like what I don't know what any topic that is like health growth, mindset, whatever it is, I want to read it. And I want to like, there's something I can take away from that. So I started to do that. And I started to read a lot and sit here and say, wow, like, you know, from every single thing I've read, there are so many powerful messages and things that have just like really, really, really given me hope and said, and, and, and shown me that, you know, I'm not alone because for the longest time I felt like that because I, um, had told myself like, there's no way you can Mm -hmm. tell people about your experience because they will judge you for it. And I basically, I would tell myself that that was my inner critic. That wasn't even reality. I was the one telling myself all of these things for years of you can't tell your friends, you can't tell, um, anyone because like I would sit there and be like your own mom, Curtis, like literally rips you apart for being by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was like, there's no way. And then I was like, you know what? Yeah. Like, what's, what is the worst that can happen? I sat there. I'm like, what, what is going to happen? If I go online and like do this, like, are, I'm like, what are people going to be like mean in the comments? And I'm like, that's really like the reality is pe- people will probably not respond how you want them to respond. I'm like, that's the worst that can happen. So why not give it a shot, see how it goes and just go for it instead of like constantly living in fear all the time. I always, I always tell people that, um, things are never going to be as good as you think they're going to be. And they're never going to be as bad as you think they're going to be. So typically we're, we're over inflating our experience, worst case and most likely case. (laughs) They are typically all three very different. And that, that installation of hope that you had at that experience at that, that conference, whatever it was, is so like for so many people, that is the turning point because if there is no hope, what is the reason right. to change? Behavior management doesn't change as we grow. Our punishments and rewards just change and then our problems get more complicated. Um, and I think one of the most powerful ways to install hope in somebody is to, to have an experience 
in the presence of someone who is sharing a story of success that has within that story of success, similar failures. If you can identify with the failures, you then assimilate the success. If this person has had the same struggles and fallen down the same pitfalls that I have, I can reach the same mountaintop that they have. Now I'm interested in how you did that. Now we're talking about the solution because you've qualified yourself. They see themselves in someone and now they can become interested. Like, you know, you picked up this fellow's book and then bam, there it was. Now you're off to find your own way through your recovery and and how to get out of that pit of negativity. Wow. And I think another big piece of that for me was reframing the view that I had a failure because I, what I did was I person, and I feel like we all have this experience kind of like, you know, growing up being in school, like you get an F on your test. That's bad. Like you fail, like, no, not good. And just, you know, we all have, you know, our, our earliest memory or whatever it may be tied to failure. And usually it's not a good experience. It's not a good thing. Um, so for me, I would always take those or I would consider things to be failures that, that really like weren't, but I would, I would personalize it and say, well, because I didn't, you know, do good at this sport or because I'm, I failed this class or because I, you know, didn't get into this thing or whatever, I'm a failure. It's me. I'm the problem. I can't fix it. It's the way it is. And that made it very hard and almost nearly impossible for me to actually do other things, try other things because I'm like, well, I already failed at all these things. So why, why should I do that? Like, I know it's just going to be embarrassing. And, and just, and again, like, like trying to, to basically train myself to choose your inner cheerleader over your inner critic. And like, I'm a big sports person. So, um, Michael Jordan didn't make his JV high school basketball team. Wow. One of the greatest basketball, Dennis Rodman didn't make a single sports team until he went to community college at the age of 22. And even then he didn't even know what the game of basketball was. He just wanted a place to connect with people. Like what? if, if everybody just stopped when they got their first rejection, like the world would be empty of some of the greatest people that we know. Failure is implied. When you experience a success, failure is implied. Very few people who are successful only have successes. That's just not how human nature works. It's part, you know, it's part of it. Like you have to, I was talking to this, uh, actually interviewing um, another girl today who's 20 years old, started a nonprofit at 16 years old and was telling me, you know, if, if I hadn't failed and I hadn't struggled with an eating disorder, if I hadn't struggled with anxiety and depression, then there would be no nonprofit. Mm-hmm. There would be no, none of this because there wouldn't be. So I'm like, that's, that's an incredible way to look at that. Mm-hmm. Crisis is opportunity. Problems are opportunity. I mean, these mm-hmm. are, these are the cornerstones of, of, of all of our therapeutic approaches that, mm-hmm. that we bring here but one of the things i'm looking into i've been researching stuff around uh, organizational psychology and Mm -hmm. there's a guy named uh, adam grant who's uh, really popular in that area and and he talks about uh thomas edison who is the greatest failure of all time Mm because he has like thousands and thousands of patents but we only know of like six of his Mm -hmm. that are actually successful you know and they're really successful the light bulb and and you know all these things but you know, his key to success is all of his failures. Like that's really what, and then most of the the greatest things, you know, a lot of the greatest event, I mean, Oprah, I mean, Oprah has been through traumas and adversity and just, I mean, Mm -hmm. she didn't get there because she had everything handed to her. I mean, she really overcame these adversities. Mm -hmm. And I think that makes people more, I think more valuable to to kind of like, they've shown, I mean, that's how we change. That's how our brain changes is through pushing, you know, getting through adversity, overcoming that. And, and so, yeah, I I think unfortunately we, we give mistakes a bad name or failures a bad name. So, uh, one of the things that I would like to end on is just your hopes where you would want to see mental health or what, what would be kind of a hope for yours? I love that so much. That's such an incredible question. What I would love is, you know, just kind of this concept that we talked about at the beginning, if, if more conversations surrounding mental health were able to be as easily talked about as like the weather or, you know, any of these things that were, it's so easy to get into, like nothing's holding us back. And then I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, what would our world look like Mm -hmm. if there was no stigma? 
like none at all. It didn't exist at all. Um, and I'm sitting here and I would always think about this and say, you know, this would help. I feel like it would help with a lot of the things that we see that, you know, because I feel like whenever you turn on the news, you see all these like these violent crimes that are committed, you know, things that are like happening to families and, and people all over the world and all of these different things. And, you know, would that potentially look better if 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 there was no roadblock, no stigma, nothing holding people back from getting help and and, and actually ch- shifting this view and actually the norm was to everyone uh, encouraged to get help at any time. So it's almost like it's, it would be weird not to is the new norm instead of, um, that. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking like, that's really what I want to happen is to have, you know, cont- to continue working towards having the stigma to be completely eliminated. Just so just to see a lot of, just to see what the world, like, what would that be like? What would that change? I think not yeah. non-judgment and more curiosity yeah. and understanding because mm-hmm. that's really stigma is rooted in judgment. So Mm -hmm. if we can get rid of judgment and people's first instinct is to try to understand Mm -hmm. rather than to lash out or Mm -hmm. judge or make assumptions, but to be curious, like I want to understand what your experience is to understand maybe your behavior or, Mm -hmm. you know, those actions. So Paris, thank you for uh, joining us and, and, and really having this really um, awesome conversation. This is something that I love getting into more than anything. And I, I was just very happy, very happy to virtually be here with you guys. So (laughs) appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks Paris. Thank you guys.